Welcome back to Reading Bear. Today, we will take a look at some new Mauritius compliance stories. And if you enjoyed my content, please don't forget to subscribe to my channel and post some bear emojis in the comments. Let's go! The first story is titled, Lady demands the amount of candy be the exact weight, loses one kilogram of candy. This happened in October 2017, I used to work at this really sucky retail store, basically just imagine party central but it looks worse. So it was Halloween season and people went to our store to buy a lot of candies, like kilograms of candies. We had this sweet that was really good, tasted like watermelon, and people went nuts to buy it and then we finally meet Karen. Karen is a typical Karen, the typical, let me talk to your manager, haircut, she went to our candy stall and told me to buy 5 kilograms of our watermelon candies. Now 1 kilogram is $5 so it was gonna amount to $25 but she told me to get the exact amount and weigh it, I weigh the candies so she knew I wasn't scamming her or ripping her off. After I weighed it, it turned out it was 6 kilograms, I then got some of the candies and put them back in the display, she immediately freaked out and said she wanted those and I just stared her and said, you wanted the exact amount of candies, you get the exact amount of candies. The next story is titled, boss doesn't have time to discuss tips I'm not supposed to take, okay, time to make real money. I used to work as a stockman for a very big chain store. It would probably take you one guess to guess which one. I was 17 years old, fit, into sports, and was not lazy. My stockman co-workers were lazy, slow, and had no motivation. If I saw a box said, two-person lift, I just put it on my shoulder and left with the customer to the front checkout. My co-workers would go find someone and even then they had a hard time lifting anything overhead. Customers were always so happy to have me help them and I got frequent tips. I wasn't supposed to take tips and I would tell them that. Some people insisted and would get angry if I didn't take it. The first time it happened I reported it, because my training said I was supposed to give it to the store, the manager on duty said, I don't care what you do, I don't have time for this right now. In my 17 year old mind I said, okay. The town I worked in was where rich people went to go vacation and had homes they rented out for like 2000 a week. They had no problem giving me 20 bucks or more. I made so much money just being a decent helpful human being that didn't waste people's time, that I ended up getting my own down payment for my own car. Nice. The next story is titled, Company doesn't think we'd do this to spite them. Quick explain, spent almost my entire life working union for a big company. I was part of a team that field tested and commissioned new equipment. This was always new tech as the world was transients from analog to digital. Basically we were the troubleshooters of the stuff that came out of the labs and had to start making money now. Because of that we became well known and made a lot of enemies because we had to flag down reasons why stuff didn't work right off the bat and we had to point fingers. Eventually we pissed off enough people to warrant a change in middle management and we get called into a meeting where we are told we are being split as a group, we were a tight group of a dozen techs willing to travel and do insane hours to meet due dates and redistributed with the install teams, who caused about 50% of issues. It turned out to be a nasty meeting, that had a lot of consequences throughout my whole career. A point was brought up that we could all be taking a holiday at the same time, so where would they be? We were told this could never happen. At the time, if a team had 10 plus techs, you were allowed two techs off at the same time. Well, come spring and a brave one starts checking if we would be willing to take a week off to go fishing together. Since they've split us up, two per install team, it's feasible and we all get on board and scheduled that particular week for holiday. Now, none of the low level drones who are our bosses are aware that this could be an issue and they all give their okay. Remember, we're union, once our holidays are approved by management, this is carved in stone. So, the actual drone who is managing that dozen techs distributed in six different groups starts wanting to make his slat systems line up, acceptance and testing schedule for that week. Goes to first boss and tells him he needs the two techs for whatever project. He gets told the two slat guys are off that particular week in two weeks. Goes to see the next boss, same answer. This particular drone is the real boss, not that dumb and quickly figures out what we've done. However, to cancel an agreed upon holiday takes an act of God, just below CEO level. Here's the thing, because they knew that the meeting to split us up would be highly, contentious, they made sure that minutes of the meeting would be taken and spread far and wide, and since we had mentioned this issue, they couldn't do a thing about it. 
After the amazing week of bonding, hadn't gone fishing since I was a boy, when we walked back in the office, all at different times, we couldn't help looking at our second level, my boss boss, and give him the biggest crap eating grin a face can make. The echoes we heard, they had a post-mortem because of all the missed due dates and this comment, you wanted to break them up and they are willing to give up a week's holiday to make us look like idiots. They have never been so united. While the company had announced high and low that they were splitting us apart for the greater good, they never announced that they put the band back together. As a union tech having spent my entire career in one company, I gotta say that a big part of my career was malicious compliance, or, as we called it, work to rule. The next story is titled, Teacher Allows Reviewing the Essay Questions Ahead of Time and a Single-Sided Note Sheet. In my 7th grade history class the teacher was giving an essay test one week so he released a list of like 11 potential essay questions the night before the test of which 3 or 4 could be chosen and answered to complete the test. He also said we could have a one-sided note sheet. Long story short I used the smallest legible font and the widest margins with the least space between lines and a bunch of words spelled with as few LTTRS as possible and wrote complete answers to every question the night before the test, it was over 11,000 words on a single side of paper. I then printed a bunch of copies and gave them out to as many people as I could since my teacher never said we had to make our own note sheet. I know I helped at least one F student get AC plus that day, though I always wondered how she didnt managed to get better because all of my answers got an are on my test. Suffice it to say that he had to make a new policy regarding note sheets. The next story is titled, Skinny Man Gets Stuffed. This was in a US high school, I didn't get satiated from the school lunch, so I figured I would bring some of my own. I brought a cheap sandwich, white turkey and cheese to help me in this dilemma. I ate my lunch, chilled with friends, and ended up forgetting about my sandwich, then rushed to my next class. It was a pretty pointless class, just some overly basic PowerPoint instruction. I was bored during a lecture or whatever, then I remembered my sandwich. I started eating it, not being loud or anything. I get halfway through and the teacher asks me what I'm doing. I'm eating a sandwich. He tells me to put the sandwich somewhere. I asked if I could finish it since there wasn't much left, this move had no effect. He said, put the sandwich somewhere or I'm writing you up. I said, okay, and put the sandwich in my stomach. He asked what I did and I told him I put it in my stomach. I was sent to the principal's office and I laughed the whole way. He didn't like me after that. A separate short, I also was told I couldn't wear headphones in the hallway. I read the rules, brought a Bluetooth speaker, and played my music. They never stopped me, but when they tried I told them there was only a rule against headphones. I wonder if they ever changed the rule at all. The next story is titled, Write me up for being tardy on a day I'm not required to be at work. I won't do that again. I used to work a manufacturing job that had some weird rules. I am not a morning person and manufacturing jobs tend to start very early because back in the day you could only work when it was light out. Why they still start at 6am is beyond me. This particular employer had a rule where you would be written up if you were tardy five or more times in a month. If you didn't show up, it wouldn't count against you other than not being paid for those hours. Again, I am not a morning person and find it difficult to get myself out of bed and to work at those times. Monday to Friday were mandatory days for us to work and most Saturdays you could get an additional four to five hours if you wanted to and the work was available. My boss, S, when I started told me that if I came in on Saturday, I could start whenever I wanted and it wouldn't count towards being tardy, since I would be helping them out. A few years later another supervisor, B, was hired and I directly reported to him, and he reported to my old boss, S. There was one particular month where I was tardy four times and I made sure the entire last week to get in on time so I wouldn't hear about it. The following Monday I was given a written warning for being tardy too many times. I told B flat out that I knew I was only tardy four times and that I shouldn't be getting written up for it. He told me, no, last Saturday you showed up at 6.30 and we start at 6 o'clock. I told him, S, told me it was fine. He said it didn't matter and those were the rules. I told him I would never be tardy on a Saturday again. I then wrote in my response on the written warning that I would never be tardy on a Saturday again. I signed it, B, signed it and made a copy of it, and filed his copy with our a few weeks later we had some maintenance needed on one of our machines and B decided we would do it that Saturday and asked if I wanted to come in and help. 
It was a dirty job pulling a bad cable out of the machine and threading a new one through a tight spot that needed cable pulling lubricant in order to fit it. I pulled up to the shop, saw it was 6 o'clock on my clock and knew I wouldn't make it in on time, turned my car around and drove home. On Monday, B was complaining about how much of a pain in the ass the job was and asked me where I was. I told him that I was going to be tardy so I went home so I wouldn't get in trouble for it. The next story is titled, You Want a Bottle of Wine? Here, let me know how that goes for you. I work at a small Chinese restaurant that generally only has locals and regulars with the odd visit from out of the area. Because it's so small on a normal day or night, we will only have one waitress on a shift. We were having a relatively quiet night so I was sitting around pouring soy sauce into bottles and cleaning chili jars. This table of four people walk in and they're all relatively nice and I give them the good old casual greeting and seat them down. They do their stuff and order their meal and for drinks, they only get table water which is normal. When I bring out their food the old man, henceforth om, asked for a bottle of the red wine. Now we don't serve alcohol nor do we even have a bio. I'm not yet 18 so I can't even handle alcohol if we did. I told him we don't have any alcohol, and he goes on this rage pointing out a bottle that was on our shelf. I knew what he was pointing to. It was our Chinese vinegar. Now, these bottles look remarkably like Asian alcohol. They're green with red on it and all the writing is in Chinese. And I told him that, sir that's vinegar, not wine. He went on an alcoholic rage yelling about how I couldn't know what alcohol was cause I was underage and how I was hiding alcohol from him and he would make a complaint on our Facebook page. His children and wife look embarrassed and are trying to hide themselves, and his wife gives me a look that just says, do it and he'll regret it. So I went and got a bottle of the vinegar and put it on the table. Om makes a really big deal out of it saying crap like, ah wasn't that easy, waitresses in my day would have done it in two seconds. I walk away and when I turn around to check, he'd spat a mouthful of vinegar out and onto the plate and was trying to wash out the taste of Chinese vinegar with water. To be fair the wife did come up to me later and apologize for his idiocy. They never made that Facebook post, and paid $20 for the bottle since we couldn't use it again. The next story is titled, She Needs to Wear Makeup? Okay, she'll go for the natural look. One of the first jobs my wonderful mother had was in the retail industry. Most retail brands will ask you to wear clothing similar to the style being sold, dress fashionably, and so on. This one went a step further. They asked all their female employees to wear makeup. My mother wasn't one to wear makeup at that point in her life. She found it a waste of time and money, and she did fine with the job and was actually later promoted for working well. Well, the upper management thought that her hard work was less important than the fact that she didn't wear makeup. They directly came to her and requested that she wear makeup. She refused, but they kept asking. Finally, they stipulated that if she would wear at least mascara then they would stop with the harassment. She agreed. The next day my wonderful mother walked in wearing her brand new, clear mascara. She very proudly wore it every day after that and the management couldn't say a thing, as she was indeed wearing mascara. The next story is titled, You want your fries now? Here are your fries now. I work at a French fry stand during my free time to earn some extra money. Last week, we had this customer who was really impatient. There was an old lady who paid before her. She wanted her fries to be first. I said, sorry can't do that. She said she's going to be late for something. As I cook her fries, she asked me how much time does she have to wait for them to cook. I said for 6 minutes. Only 2 minutes in, she asked me again and at three minutes she wanted the fries. I told her that it's not yet cooked and they're still cold inside. She said she didn't care. I told her to give me the money first. She gave the money, I gave the fries still cold inside. She took a couple of fries and ate them at the same time. She spat the fries into the little paper bag the fries come with. She wanted a refund I said, sorry can't do that. The next story is titled, Don't Acknowledge Receipt of My Fax? I'll give you the facts that never ends, do collections that, occasionally involved speaking with businesses about past due accounts. Their main tactic was postponement and delay, of any kind. Negotiations could drag on for months, even if you were speaking to the principal payee or their lawyer. I would fax important paperwork, receive a fax confirmation and yet, somehow, they, didn't receive it. Oh, gee, sorry. Can you refax? 
My response was to apologize for the confusion and ask them if it was okay for me to continue to re-fax the paperwork until they finally received a copy. I would always receive a smug chore from them because they had no intention of acknowledging receipt and planned on simply throwing the fax away. So they thought. I would make three copies of the bill, tape them end to end, feed the first copy into the fax and, as the top came out, quickly tape it to the bottom of the third copy, making an endless loop for faxing. Within the hour, I would receive a call screaming obscenities about their jammed fax machine and how much trouble I was in. My response was, so you acknowledge receipt of my fax? But, 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 but. Sorry, you said I could. The next story is titled, ID every customer with no exception? That includes the manager too. My friend told me this beautiful story that needs to be heard. A few years ago she worked at a little hole in the wall franchise liquor store here in AB, Canada. The staff received a notice from management stating that they suspected AGLC, Alberta Gaming and Liquor Commission, was going to be doing some secret shopping in the area to find liquor stores who weren't checking for ID, and that as such they were to ID every single customer without exception. Having worked at a liquor store myself, this would suck, but it beats getting a personal fine and pissing the boss off getting them a big fine as well. So one day my friend is on shift and her horrible manager, franchise owner who no one liked comes in to purchase a bottle. My friend asks for ID. This ensues. Friend, can I see some ID? Manager, I didn't bring it with me. Just ring me up. Friend, sorry, as per your memo I can't do that. I need to see ID for every customer. No exceptions. Manager, friend, ring me up. Now. Or you'll be written up. Friend, sorry, no can do manager. You were very explicit we ID everyone. You should have known to bring yours. Manager, obviously that doesn't apply to me. I own the store. Ring me up or you're fired. Friend, guess I'll leave then. So my friend drops her apron and starts walking to the door, and her manager lunges for her and grabs her and starts yelling in her face about how she's fired and going to be banned from every franchise store for life due to insubordination blah blah blah. Then, out of nowhere, a plainclothes cop cuffs the manager and she gets arrested for assault. As it turns out, in the line behind Psycho Manager was not only a plainclothes officer but an AGLC employee. In the end, the AGLC employee fined the manager over $10,000 and she was fired by the franchise for the incident and banned from even entering one of their stores again. In addition to the suspended sentence and community service time she was sentenced to for assaulting her staff member. The next story is titled, Force an Atheist to Read a Prayer? I'll pick just the right one. Years ago, I went to a Catholic high school. I was also an atheist. Not an in-your-face, douchey atheist, I just didn't believe in God and wasn't going to lie about it. They offered a solid education, it's part of the curriculum, I had a lot of Catholic friends, so I'm obviously not going to be a jerk about it. I had no issue showing up at mass and being respectful, taking four years of religion courses, or doing community service. But that didn't mean I wanted to lead the prayer. I didn't really mind saying a few words, but reading from the Bible never sat well with me and felt disingenuous. Luckily, most teachers were awesome and I could respectfully opt out. But at least once a year, some teacher would absolutely insist that I get up and read from, one of the many beautiful passages you should know by now. Okay. I would walk to the front, say the traditional greeting, in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and then I would read, 2 Kings chapter 2 verses 23-34. From there Elisha went up to Bethel. As he was walking along the road, some boys came out of the town and jeered at him. Get out of here, Baldy, they said. Get out of here, Baldy. He turned around, looked at them and called down a curse on them in the name of the Lord. Then two bears came out of the woods and mauled 42 of the boys. For times I didn't feel like going with 42 children being brutally mauled by bears for making fun of a bald guy, there was another passage that was, somehow, often a more appropriate read. Deuteronomy chapter 25 verses 11 to 12. If two men are fighting and the wife of one of them comes to rescue her husband from his assailant, and she reaches out and seizes him by his private parts, you shall cut off her hand. Show her no mercy. And then I'd finish up with the sign of the cross and head back to my seat. And what do you know? My turn to say prayer never seemed to come around again. The next story is titled, Don't want to listen to the guy who's been on his machine for 30 years? Guess you don't need your fingers. 
Back in the early 2000s, I was a management trainee for a manufacturing company in the UK, and I was responsible for quality control and production management. I was 22 years old, keen as punch and ready to change the world. About 11 months into the role, I got a new boss, let's call him, Fred. Fred was also the company owner's son and was basically a 45-year-old giant toddler who had only ever been a drug dealer, DJ and now stood to inherit the entire company. His management style was, let's say, interesting, and he would deviate from, screaming at you for the most benign thing ever, to, I can't deal with the pressure so I'll go home for the day, in a matter of hours. He also thought he was a manufacturing genius. His ideas were batcrap crazy, but he would scream at anyone who questioned him. There was a 52-year-old machine operative, let's call him, Roy, who has worked on the same machine for over 30 years. Roy could tell when his machine was two weeks away from a breakdown, just because it sounded different. He was truly at one with his machine. Fred decided that we would modify Roy's machine so that we could extend the range of products we could manufacture. In order to do this, he decided that we would add an additional spindle to the machine. The problem was that each product would finish at a different time and you would need to remove a product from the machine while the other one was still spinning. Roy protested and said he'd never use it, but Fred went ahead and modified it over the weekend with a subcontractor. On Monday, Roy said, you must be joking, I'm not using that. Fred said, you will use it, or you'll be looking for a new job tomorrow. Roy said, it's not safe and I won't use it. If you try to make me I will report you to the house. And then Fred said, if you report me, I'll make sure you don't find work ever again. So Roy smiled and said, okay, fine, I'll load the next job, but you can run it first. Roy loaded on his next job and took two steps back. He also looked at me and said, stand back. Fred started the machine, and all went well, for about 30 seconds. The first job had reached the diameter required and Fred pressed, stop, however, he now had to lean over the other job that was still running at 2000 RPM. I didn't see it happen, but I heard an awful scream and then saw blood squirting everywhere. Fred fainted onto the machine, narrowly missing the spindle with his face and greasy long black hair. We pressed the emergency stop and picked him up, and it was then I spotted his fingers in the machine. I picked up two middle fingers and gave them to a colleague to put into a freezer bag, which was a waste of time because they couldn't reattach them, they were too mangled. Fred never came back to work. Apparently, he told his father he wasn't cut out for running the company and I also left about six months later. I saw recently that it was bought out in a management buyout and good old Roy was the operations director. Good for him. If you enjoyed the video, please subscribe to the channel and post some bear emojis in the comment.